Amen. So uh, I, I titled this message, Are You an Obstacle or an Instrument? Um, and I, I put this title on it because it seems like, you know, we're hearing, if you put your antenna up to the Christian world, uh, we're hearing a lot of times that we are basically an obstacle, that we are an obstacle to God, um, that we are a serious, serious problem. And even after salvation, even after we're born again, even after we become Christians, uh, that there's about 27 things we need to do in order to get clean and get clear and get compatible and get functional. And we're just dysfunctional. Like God is wanting to, to use us, but, but he just can't uh, because we're the problem. We're an obstacle. It's very popular to hear this, and, and, I, and I could almost just spend a whole morning talking about the different veins and the different flavors of it, um, but this morning, I want to, uh, you know, just touch on a few, because it's almost like we've got a bunch of theologies, a bunch of belief systems out there that are subtly or very directly telling you that um, you're, you're not okay you're not okay in your current state, uh, that you have to do some things and then you might be okay, but as soon as you do those things, there'll be some other things you'll need to do to be further okay. And so you're never quite okay, you're progressively moving into okayness, but you never arrive. And so right now you might believe that you're 67% compatible with God, if you're lucky, Maybe you're only 43% compatible. So what, I, what I'm trying to do is peel away some of the jargon that we've heard. Um, and uh, then I want you to think about in this moment, is there anything wrong with God in this moment? Is there anything wrong with the God of the universe in this moment? Well, of course not. He's God. He's perfect. Nothing wrong with him. Is there anything wrong with the message of the gospel? Just think about the gospel itself, handwritten by the hand of God, proclaimed by the mouth of God through people, but the message itself, is there anything wrong with the message? Well, of course not. If it's the gospel, it's the good news, it's the great news, it's perfect. Okay, so we're narrowing it down. And do you see then that if we only have these three players, then we arrive at the inevitable conclusion that you are now the problem. It's not God. It's not the message. So you must be the problem. With only three players on the board, that is the most natural conclusion that we arrive at. And so we are suckers. We are suckers for the idea that you need to do more and be more and get right and get clean and you're not okay and you're going to be okay, maybe, but not really. And on and on it goes with the circus. A lot of theology today actually promotes the dirty worm syndrome. You are a dirty, dirty, rotten worm. Born again, but a born again, dirty, rotten, rotten, rotten. Did I say rotten worm? And so there's actually flavors of, of belief and flavors of theology that if you were to say that sort of thing, you are actually aligning yourself, they believe. You're aligning yourself with the truth, and you're becoming more humble in doing so. And so what does a dirty worm, if you're going to agree with this, that you're the problem, what does a dirty worm then have to do? I mean, Jesus already died, right? Jesus w has already been resurrected. Jesus' work is done. So if you're a dirty worm, what are you going to do to fix it? Because apparently it's not Jesus. He's done his part. So now you've got something that you're going to label your part in fixing you, getting yourself right, and getting yourself okay. Now... We're not going to deny that there's a problem. There is a problem. I mean, there's a problem in our thinking. There's a problem sometimes in the choices we make. 
There's a renovation going on in our mindsets. There is a problem. All I'm saying is, what if you're not the problem? What if the problem is not you? Going back to this sketch, what I'm saying is, what if there are other players in the game? Because if you're not right now, how are you going to get right? If you're not okay now, how are you going to get okay? If you're not compatible, if you're an obstacle, how are you going to cease being an obstacle? You have bought the lie that you are an obstacle to the God of the universe when he has already fixed you and you're compatible with him. So let's talk about this term surrender. You've heard the term surrender. Now, surrender might be a term that we could use about a salvation choice, a choice to believe, repent, turn from your old ways, and become a Christian. But even then, the word is not used that way in the Bible. Did you know that this word surrender is not used in any Christian faith sense in the Bible anywhere? Oh, I mean, you can find it in the Old Testament if you search for battles with armies, you know, where there's two enemies and they're fighting each other, and one wins and the other surrenders. Oh, you can find it in that context. But you can't find it in the New Testament letters, for example. You can't find it in the writings about our relationship with God as his children. Imagine if I told my son Gavin that he needs to surrender to me. What does that communicate? Son, you and I are not on the same team. You and I are on opposing armies, and I have now defeated you, and you must surrender to me. I mean, this is the most common use of the word surrender, isn't it? Now, I'm pointing this out not to criticize any and all of us, because I've been a, you know, a user of this term myself. You could probably look through my books and find it once or twice here or there. My, my point is not to criticize the use of the word, but to investigate why we're using it. And why it's so common to think that the answer is that I need to surrender, surrender, surrender to God. Surrender is when an opposing team or an opposing army takes over, conquers, you're defeated, and you were not on their team. Are you on God's team? A new creation, a child of God. The old self, dead, buried, gone, raised to newness of life. I wonder if there's not a better word than surrender. Because look at now, look at what I'm believing about myself. Behind this word, there's a belief. Behind this word, there's a theology. I'm believing that I'm the dirty worm. I'm believing that I'm the obstacle. And that if I surrender, somehow the obstacle might be lessened. And so I'm going to, oh, here's one. I'm going to try my hardest not to be prideful. Yeah. And then one day you'll arrive at a place where you say, you guys need to hear about how I'm not prideful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I probably said this before, but I love it when, um, when people say, uh, Man, I'm really struggling with pride, right? I like to say, oh, really, about what? And then just see what it, what it is. Because <laughs> usually it's kind of, you know, it's kind of lame. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, like, when you think about, like, you know, people conquering kingdoms and, like, you know, there's always somebody who's done more. Um. But anyway, it, it's, like a, it's like a construction project that you're going to conquer your, your, your anger. You're going to conquer this issue. You're going to conquer that issue, and you're not quite right, and you're not quite okay. And you're going to make yourself okay by some sort of surrender. So let's talk about what the Bible actually says to do. I mean, the closest thing, if you want to call it close, is offer your body. All right, what does that even mean? What does that look like? Well, here we are in Romans 12. He says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. Sound like uh, you're on God's team? Is the, uh, 
is the instrument dirty? Is the instrument nasty? Is, does the flesh, the, the fleshly body, is it the enemy? Is it the obstacle? Or is it the tool, the instrument? Because what I'm seeing here is, first of all, it's, it's not an animal sacrifice that you're trying to appease a deity with. In the Old Testament, they would lay an animal sacrifice on a fire, and, and, and that would be a dead sacrifice. This is a living sacrifice. Did you notice that this is a living sacrifice? That word in there, it's not in there by coincidence. People typically, when you think of sacrifice, you think of somebody's got to die. Somebody or something has got to croak. It has to cease to be because its life somehow needs to be snuffed out so that God can be satisfied. That's what we normally think of with a sacrifice. Now, what he's saying here is, no, no, I want the sacrifice to live. I want the sacrifice to live on. I'm not calling your body an obstacle. Your body is holy and your body is acceptable to me, he says. So maybe you've thought, you know, somewhere along the line, you've gotten just a pinch of the idea that, you know, the most important thing is spirit, maybe spirit and soul, but the body is really the problem, and you're supposed to say no to your body to say yes to God. Well, there, there's a subtle lie in there. Your body is not the enemy. Sin is the enemy. Your body is a tool a tool can be used by sin or God. The tool is not the enemy. Your humanity is not the enemy. Jesus came in humanity. Jesus presented himself as human, and it was real. Humanity is compatible with God's divinity. That's the way it was from the beginning. Yes, we have fallen bodies. There's a fallen world. There's death. There's disease. There's flawed DNA. There's issues. There's problems. But look at this, holy, acceptable to him. A living sacrifice doesn't need to die. Now, uh, secondly, I want you to see that this is praise and worship. You know, praise and worship, I threw that word praise in there because we normally think praise and worship, praise and worship. How long does it last? 23 minutes. <laughs> and then there's announcements and then there's the sermon, right? But apparently, praise and worship your reasonable, your spiritual service of worship, another translation says your reasonable act, the most reasonable thing you could do is say, huh, I've got this instrument, sin or God? Mm, I'll choose God. Seems reasonable. And then you're worshiping. Now, we're worshiping, right, with our mouths when we sing songs, and Josh and Jay, they lead us. We are worshiping God because this is, our instrument, and we're choosing God. But all I'm saying is it's not about 23 minutes. About 1% of your praise and worship involves singing. About 1% of your praise and worship involves singing. The other 99% is everything else we do in dependency on Jesus. So he says, don't be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you get your mind renewed? Present your mind. Present your mind. Present your body. Present yourself. Say, here I am. Do whatever you want. I'm cool with it. Because you have the market cornered on everything awesome, and nothing else compares. And we're on the same team, and I've figured out what it means to be on Team God. And I'm not going to be a sucker for the other team. But we got Christians, we don't even, some Christians, we, we don't even know what team we're on. We're trying to get on the team. We're trying to qualify to be on the team. And he's saying, man, I have qualified you. You're on the team. I've made you like me at the core. You're compatible. So, yes, we might surrender to an opposing team, an enemy, but with God our Father, we simply wake up each day and offer our bodies as living, not dead, sacrifices. If we're his children, 
we're already on his team. Amen? Amen. Come on. Yeah. Well, you didn't have to repeat the come on. See? <laughs> See, the amen was for you, but the come on was just, you know, good job. We're not real charismatic, but we're getting there. Amen. Yeah. I'm learning too, right? Because I'm going play, and I don't even know what's happening. They're talking when I'm talking. <laughs> you do not talk when I talk. All right, back to the story. <laughs> Offer yourselves is the second thing. We're talking about surrender. Surrender's not in the Bible, except for with, like, with armies, but not with the Christian life. We're talking about surrender. So what does it mean to offer yourself? Because this is kind of the second closest thing we've got. He says in Romans 6, God is telling us through Paul, he says, therefore... Do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of righteousness. So wait a minute. Are you an obstacle or an instrument? What do you read up there? See, even the child knows. <laughs> instrument. That's, that's what they're saying. See, I'm a linguist. Are you an obstacle or an instrument? Well, apparently we present the members of our body either as an instrument to sin or as an instrument to God. Anything wrong with the instrument? No, it's where you offer it. Anything wrong with you? No, it's just where you're looking. So don't go on presenting the members of your body to sin. Present yourselves. Notice that he switches. You know, first it was body, now it's just yourselves. So you and your body are all one whole. You and your body to God are all one instrument. There's no, he wants two-thirds of you and can't use the other third or something. Like, all of you it belongs to God. And so he says, present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. All right. So, apparently, the Spirit is the power, right? You're not God. I'm not God. It's not the fruit of me. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Where's the life come from? He is the life. I'm not the life. You're not the life. He's the life. But we are the instrument, and we are compatible. Imagine... Pardon me, I'm not very musical, but I, I'm going to get Josh's... Maybe I'm going to get Josh... See, I don't even know how to release it from this little thing. I'm so unmusical. Uh, Josh... Uh, oh, oh, there's a little swing arm. Okay. See? Okay. Uh, see, Josh, I'm sorry, I probably broke... Okay. All right. Now, I want you to imagine... I don't even know what's happening at this point. This was not rehearsed. Um, and I don't play anything, and nor am I about to play anything. But I just want you to imagine Joshua Sills um, every, every Sunday leading worship on stage, okay? And at some point during each and every, each and every song, uh, there's a point at which Josh begins to grow angry at his guitar. And you can see that he's actually done that a few times. <laughs> All right. But Josh begins to have a war with his guitar, and he begins to curse at it and claim that it, it can't be used and that it's not right and that it's not a good instrument. And he's mid-song, and he's trying to play, and everybody wants to enjoy a song, but it just can't happen because, God, because Josh's, Josh's relationship with his guitar is just not right. Now, absurd. I mean, what would that look like? Well, it would look ridiculous because Josh has chosen an instrument and he's chosen an instrument that he can play and he chose it carefully and wisely and it's compatible with him and it's compatible with the music that he wants to play. But to engage in some sort of criticism of the instrument in the midst of it all would be totally counterproductive and make no sense. And this is what we think is happening when we're the instrument and God is just never, ever, ever satisfied? 
Do you see what we're doing? What if you're not the problem? What if you're not a problem? So we've got God, we've got the message, and then we've got me. Remember, we've got the three players. So we arrive at this conclusion. You see it there in red. I must be the problem. You see how we arrive at it. But, of course, the Bible tells us a different story. And I hope that you can grasp what we're talking about here, that there are other players in the game. The flesh, the power of sin, and the world. The flesh can say, I want you to be my instrument. The power of sin can say, I want you to be my instrument. The world can say, I want you to be my instrument. There are other players, but the instrument is not the problem. The other players are the problem. And if our belief system does not have the many players in the game, then we're going to miss it. That we're perfectly, we're perfectly okay with God. That's what righteousness is. Righteousness is okayness. Okayness is a free gift. You are okay with God. We need to be saying this, yes, even in church. (laughs) Yeah. If we are still under the delusion that we want to sin, that we are dirty and distant, that we want to sin, that we are incompatible because we are dirty, dirty sinners still, It is no wonder that we cannot trust the message of grace. It is only when we see God has made our hearts new and trustworthy that freedom makes any sense at all. People are fighting against grace. You know what they're really fighting against? They're not fighting against grace. They're fighting against the idea that they are compatible with grace. They don't believe they're compatible with grace. Theoretically, grace is an incredible, beautiful message. It just doesn't work for me because my heart's dirty. You see, what they're really fighting against is you are shaking their view of themselves as Christians. Wonderful notion of grace won't work for my heart. So, you see... They're not going to say God is the problem. They're not going to say the message is really the problem. The problem is you combine that message with a guy like me, and I'll just go crazy setting world records for sin because I'm a sinner, 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 dirty, rotten worm of a sinner. And as long as I believe that and I miss the fact that I've taken out your heart of stone, I've given you a new heart, a new spirit, and my spirit, and I've made your heart new and trustworthy. If I miss that element, well, of course, freedom doesn't make any sense at all. So what if there's nothing wrong with you? What if you are not the problem? What if you're like that musical instrument? And you can be offered to sin or offered to God. Another way to put it is, you are the new creation. Is the new creation compatible? Or does the new creation need to say, I give up. I'm nothing like you. I can never be like you. You're better than me. I'm not compatible with you. You hate my heart. Is that what the new creation has to say to finally somehow then what? Be zapped a little bit more and cleaned up some? Or are you willing to believe in what's called the finished work of Christ that the heart surgery is over and that your heart is trustworthy, that God trusts your heart because you became obedient from the heart, Romans 6. Another way to put it, You're an instrument, you're a new creation, you're a child of God. Hey, Gavin, I say to my son one day, hey, Gavin, you know, I really want relationship with you, son. 
I really want relationship with you. There's only one problem. You. Yeah. They would send me off to Child Protective Services immediately to have a little discussion. Do you see what we've done? Do you see how we've disfigured the face of our Father? Because we won't believe we're okay. So how do we offer? People say, how do we offer? How do we offer? How do we offer? Well, by faith. I mean, we believe. Is this just something new to do then? Have I told you to go off now and do something new? Try your best to offer. Try your best to offer yourself. Well, what we're really talking about is believe. Believe what? Refuse to believe you're an obstacle, number one. Refuse to believe you're an obstacle. Deny the lie and believe you're an instrument. And you say, people say, well, you know, what's the result of that? I don't know. I mean, I thought about this long and hard, and I thought I could, you know, maybe give this incredible treatise on all the results that would just be teased out in your life. And quite frankly, I don't know. I don't know what the results of offering yourself, not myself, yourself to God. I, I can't tell you. But I do know that there's a thread woven throughout, and it's this. Result number one is love. And love has many facets and many flavors and many shapes and many faces, but God is love. And when you offer yourself to a God who is love, guess what comes out? Love. So, are you an obstacle or an instrument? Let's pray together. Father, um, we refuse to believe the lie that there's something wrong with us. We admit uh, we have offered ourselves to sin. Uh, we have offered ourselves to a problem called sin. We have offered ourselves to a problem called the flesh. We have offered ourselves to a problem called the world, but we are not the problem. We refuse to believe that we're the problem. We, we believe that we're part of the solution because you made us that way. That you made us not the old self, but you recreated us into the new self. We believe that we are compatible with who you are because you have made us a partaker of the divine nature, you say. You say that our nature has been swapped and that we are living in okayness, whether we realize it or not. We want to realize it, Father. We want to believe the truth. We don't want to believe a lie anymore. We don't want to believe that you're an opposing army that we have to surrender to and hope to be cleaned up. We want to believe that we're part of your family, that we're part of your team, and that we're compatible. We choose to believe that because it's the truth. Father, we thank you for this simple truth that does not debilitate us, does not tear us down but builds us up in your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. amen. Will you guys stand with us? There's no space that his love can reach. There's no place where we can't find peace. There's no end to amazing grace. percent of you that's a-ok -okay? what if it's not 64 percent that is righteous what if every single ingredient within who you are as a person every single part of the fabric of who you are what if every single ounce of your being is okay with god
What if you've been buying into the lie that somehow you're going to rid yourself of part of yourself one day and finally, finally, he'll like you. He'll be okay with you. What if that's a lie? What if you're not the problem? What if there are problems and you've given yourself over for a moment or two or 12 to those problems? But what if you, standing right here in this auditorium, what if you are not a problem with God? What if God, through Jesus Christ, has actually allowed you to be part of the solution? What if Jesus Christ is the power and you are the instrument? What if he really, really likes you?